uh, I would like to introduce uh, a man, the guest speaker today. And uh, 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 it's, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome our guest speaker with us. And uh, that is none other than uh, the State Administrative Bishop, Doctor and Pastor Sean O'Neill. Amen. He is the Church of God Overseer of California and Nevada states. Amen. And uh, you know, we had a chance to meet the pastor and his wife, Sister Sharon, with Brother Jason and uh, Brother Jason, and also with Brother Cedric. And uh, you know, Pastor, uh, 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 as, a, as a church, we are so happy that uh, uh, we could connect with the Church of God and having the fellowship under your leadership. And, uh, you know, when I'm thinking about uh, Pastor I mean, I mean, uh, Sean, uh, from my personal experience, I noticed uh, uh, many, many things uh, in many times that uh, Pastor is a, is a man of simplicity and humbleness and dedication. You know, that's true that uh, when I felt many times, you know, when I, uh, even uh, when I was calling him, you know, uh, and uh, uh, he is a man of pastoral care or pastoral concern. Amen. So he used to conduct, I mean, uh, he used to, I mean, uh, conduct us sometimes and asking, uh, I mean, uh, what is the situation there in the church? And uh, I mean, uh, uh, he used to, I mean, conduct some, some of the pastors, I mean, uh, uh, conference, Zoom co conference uh, on every Thursday, every Thursday to anchor about uh, the, the issues and the challenges that uh, every pastor and every church, I mean, go through. So that's the reason that I said that. Uh, uh, Pastor, I mean, uh, Sean is a, is a great man. He's a man of dedication and uh, he's having a concern about uh, the pastors under him. And even uh, 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 I mean, uh, whenever uh, I called him, he was ready to speak and he pick up the phones and he speak and he's asking about the situation of the church. And, and, and thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, your care and your uh, concern towards, towards our church. And we had uh, already invited him to uh, our church in April in the month of April, but uh, I mean, we couldn't make it uh, because of the coronavirus issues and all. But uh, I mean, thank you, Pastor, for showing the interest to, to, to join with us, I mean, through Zoom this morning. And uh, uh, we are so excited to hear from you, Pastor, this morning. And let us all put our hands together and welcome Pastor Sean O'Neill in our midst this morning. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a wonderful joy and honor to be with you and, um, and to share with you today. I believe that God has put us together for a purpose and for a reason and for this time. We know the scripture says for such a time as this, referring to Esther and that moment in the kingdom history. I believe this is a for such a time as this moment. It's very good to meet you, the Eternal Life Church of God in Sacramento. And um, I honor Pastor Sam Cuddy and your family. And it's so good to see everyone today. And uh, I want to just say hello and greet you. I have in the office here with me uh, who is gathered here. There are um, six, seven of us here uh, meeting here. And so joining you for worship today. Praise the Lord. Um, you know, so we're honored to be with you. I want to just take a few moments today and share with you. And the Lord has really been moving on my heart and mind in a significant way. Uh, in, in this region, this area, in our churches, we have been experiencing fasting and prayer. And we call, I called, I sensed from the Lord to call for 21 days of fasting and prayer at the beginning of this month that will conclude a week from now. And I talked with another friend of mine a few days ago, and they're doing 108 days of fasting and prayer, I believe. And so um, it is a journey where we are seeking the Lord and we are desiring to hear from God. And in this journey, it is we are on a journey and we are in a place. In fact, we're walking in a place that we've never walked before, spiritually and in this world. I know many of you perhaps are immigrants and you've come from, other, from another place, maybe from India or somewhere in India. 
in your life. Maybe you were born here as a child and your parents migrated, but and they walked in a place that they never walked before physically. I was not born in California. I'm a, a migrant in the United States since, but when my family came here, we walked in places we'd never walked before. And there are always new experiences and new challenges with that journey. Spiritually in our world today, we are walking in a place that we've never walked before in our world, in our society, in our culture, in our global, technologically connected, more intellectually informed culture than we've ever seen in this world. And in the midst of all that we are facing, there is a truth. And the truth is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we experience this truth, we have to understand and kind of navigate and understand what the Lord is saying and the Holy Spirit is communicating to us in this regard and showing us how to walk and carry out and carry forward the power, the presence, and the anointing of Jesus Christ in this world in which we live. For all of us, every one of us, every culture, every language, every tribe, every nation, um, who are centered in and redeemed by the saving blood of Jesus Christ. When we are centered in and redeemed by the saving blood of Jesus Christ, we have the anointing of Jesus to go do his work, to go do his work. And so as I share today, I just communicate to you, I'll share just briefly a moment. Cheryl and I, my wife, have been in ministry for a long time. And we've been married. In fact, next week we will have been married 32 years. Praise the Lord. And uh, very good for a young guy. And uh, we have two children. Our son is married and lives in Southern California. He's a, he is an attorney and his wife is, in fact, she just started medical school to be a physician. Um, so she has a journey ahead of her, pray for her. Our daughter is in school as well and she is a performing arts major and loves acting and, and ballet and singing. And God has given her many talents. And, and just amazing talents. I'm not a singer. She is. I try to sing, and she rolls her eyes. Dad, please don't sing. But um, those are our children, and we are here in California. We've been here serving in the administrative bishop role of the Church of God for two years. Previously to that, we have served in that role in Arizona. We also served as pastor, we've pastored uh, pretty much five churches, three of those we planted. And so God has guided us in many ways throughout our ministry journey. And we're so glad to be with you today and looking forward to visiting Sacramento area and being with you in service. Can't wait to hang out together. And um, I hope and pray we get some great food in that process. Um, maybe some um, chicken biryani or um, um, some chai tea or um, some kind of curry. That would be awesome. But um, we are very much in favor and excited about that. Looking forward to that fellowship sometime soon, prayerfully. We were supposed to be there in April, and the uh, coronavirus happened. I think it was April. And so we've had to delay our, our visit because we're all – quarantine, separated, stay at home, all these things. We are praying. We are praying. This message that I'm going to share with you today is a message that has been stirring in my heart and life for some time now. And it is a continual development of this is what God has intended for us to be as a church. So it's the actual living out of the gospel in the life of Paul the Apostle and the apostles themselves and the people that followed along with Paul and gathered with him. I believe this is an example for us. We are living in a very diverse and um, unique world today, and we need the grace of God and the strength of God 
in the guidance of God, in all of his protection and, 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 and just uh, discernment for our life. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Acts the 19th chapter, Acts chapter 19, and I'm going to read one verse of Scripture. To begin with, there will be other verses uh, throughout this message. This one verse of Scripture is in Acts chapter 19, and it is verse 10. I'm sorry, not verse 10. <laughs> Acts chapter 19, verse 23. I apologize. And the Bible says this, About that time there occurred no small disturbance concerning the way. And about that time, and the same time, there arose no small stir about the way. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your love. We thank you for your presence in our lives. We ask you to guide us in all that we are. Father, I pray that you would bring saving grace to everyone uh, that may not have a relationship with you in some way, shape, or form that would say you are our Lord and our Savior and our Redeemer. And God, that you would strengthen your body, every family, every home, every life. Father, fill us with your Holy Spirit presence and power. And God, prepare us to be world changers, culture shapers, society impactors that will absolutely turn the world upside down, turn cities upside down through the grace and power and anointing of Jesus Christ, your Son, and the power of your Holy Spirit. Bless your word today. Amen. About that time there occurred no small stir about the way. Just a few thoughts today. As we move forward in our journey of life right now in 2020, here we are, August 2020. Um, when, what, a, what an incredible time to be alive. Incredible time to live. Greater technology, greater intellectual knowledge, uh, greater opportunities to receive finance and wealth and technology and be an entrepreneur than ever before in history. The greater opportunities perhaps to be a physician or an attorney or a business person or, a, a educate, or an educator. But the greatest opportunity we have today is to absolutely fulfill the great commission in our time in a way that we've never had as people in humanity in the history of the world. Why is that? Because we have greater connectivity around this globe than we have ever had before. And right now in this moment, God is speaking to his church, I believe. And the question is, will the church listen to what God is saying? Because if we feel like when coronavirus is over and we can emerge out of hibernation, if you will, when we come out of our house, um, if we were a bear, we would come out of the cave. And as we emerge from the house, and we emerge, we could say, okay, Sunday morning, we're going to gather back together in a church, in a building, in a rental space, wherever we gather, and then we'll be back to normal. We're going to go back to where we were. I'm convinced today that God is not calling us to go back to where we were. God is calling us to go forward in his power and his anointing and his vision and his mission. Jesus was very clear in his instructions to the disciples. And um, the fact is, in Matthew 28, 19, the Bible is clear to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. We are called to be world changers. We are called to transform people from death to life and from darkness to light. This is our calling. This is our assignment as believers, as people. And so in order to go to a new place, we have to be willing to do new things. In order to do what we haven't done before, we must be willing and we must go to where we haven't gone before. And in order to go where we haven't gone before, we must do what we haven't done before or we haven't done in a long time. There are now 7.7 .7 billion people and counting living in this global earth. There's 328 million people in the United States of America. About every seven seconds, a person is born 
and about every 14 seconds a person dies and about 34, 35 seconds, a new immigrant arrives to this nation. And so about every 12 seconds or around there, um, a, a new person is added to the population of the United States of America every, every 12 seconds or around that. So very much we are continually adding people to this nation through birth, through immigration, through all. Well, we as believers have an opportunity and we have a mission. And as the church, the body of Christ, we are not called to be calm, quiet, docile, or dormant. Christianity is birthed to bring Jesus Christ to the world. Christianity was birthed to transform the world to follow Jesus. Christianity was birthed to be world-changing. In this passage of scripture in the book of Acts, there's some significant things going on. If you look back in the chapter, chapter 17, Paul was in Athens. And there in Athens, he was at Mars Hill and he was communicating to the philosophers. He looked around and there were all kinds of gods made of statue, and gods to everything. And he looked around and he found one that was made to the unknown God. And he went over and he said, this is who I want to tell you about. Let me tell you about the unknown God. I know the unknown God. And he debated with them and philosophized with them. And as a result of that, a few followed Jesus. A few followed the way that Paul was talking about. A few became connected to the unknown God. Paul went from there to Corinth in chapter 18 of Acts. And he made his way to the city of Corinth, city of illicit stuff, bad stuff, all kinds of stuff. It was a wicked place. And he went there and preached the gospel in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I do not believe that he wasn't anointed by the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 17 in Athens. But I believe perhaps in Corinth, he relied more on the Holy Spirit and less on his intellect than he did when he was in Athens. Or perhaps he used a different methodology in one city than he did in another. And he customized through the anointing of the Holy Spirit how he would communicate. There is no doubt, though, in Corinth, he would later say that he came not with the words of wisdom or the wisdom of man, but he came in the power of the Holy Spirit, he came in the power of God and communicated to them. And many were saved, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Ghost, and something powerful happened there. And then later on, we get to Acts chapter 19, and this journey of Paul, and he finds his, his self in this city named Ephesus. And in the city of Ephesus, while Paul is there, something has taken place. Something has happened. This city called Ephesus was a place of interest. It was a place of gathering. It was a place where people would come to, and they would come for. They would come to meet one another. They would come for worshiping the goddess in Roman world, Diana. But in this place, in this city, this Greek city, they would come and worship Artemis. And Artemis was the goddess of fertility. And they'd come to this city and they would worship at this temple of Artemis and they would have all kinds of things happening. And the way that some of the people in the city made money is they sold statues to the goddess Diana or goddess Artemis that people could take back home and they could make little shrines and little places to pray to. And they could pay money for these statues and all kinds of things were happening. And there were actually, there was actually a synagogue in Ephesus and there were all kind of multicultural travel, uh, commerce happening in Ephesus. And here comes Paul the Apostle. And he, began, he, he does something significant. He goes and he walks with a strategy. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But in Ephesus, in this scripture, when it talks about there's no small stir happening concerning the way. There's no, there's no small riot that occurred. There was something that happened. It was just something dramatic took place in the city, so much so that the writer notes this, that 
there was something powerful that happened in this place. In fact, there were some things that happened, and they were supernatural, if you will. Some things have taken place in Ephesus. What happened in Ephesus? People have been healed from their diseases. Praise the Lord. People have been healed from their sicknesses. People, uh, demons have been cast out of people. People have been set free from the bondage of sin and of death. They've been saved and born again. A city is being transformed before their eyes. Something has happened here in this city. When Jesus Christ is preached, something happens. Now, this is important for the church today, especially probably perhaps any time since the New Testament, because many times the church will live in a compartment on Sunday morning, but when they go to work on Monday, we forget who God is in our public life. And there has to be a connection between the private life and the public life that communicates who Christ is through how we live, how we act, how we breathe, how we move, and how we talk. Amen. When Jesus Christ is preached, something happens. Something happened in Ephesus. Paul shows up and he brings Jesus Christ with him. So there's a few questions here. I have seven questions in this message. The first question is this, what happens when we show up? What happens when you and I show up? What happens when we walk into the room? What happens when we walk into the store? What happens when we walk into school? What happens when we walk into work? What happens when we walk into a neighbor's house or to Walmart or Target or wherever we go? What happens when we show up? When Paul walked into the city, there was something dramatic that took place. So four points go with this question or these, these questions as well. The first point is this. Who was Paul? Paul was anointed. Paul was anointed. He was born again. Paul is in relationship with Jesus Christ, and he leads others to find Jesus Christ. When number two, Paul is empowered. He is empowered. He is fully Pentecostal. He has the anointing of the Holy Spirit in his life. He is fully Pentecostal. He has the Holy Spirit. He comes into Ephesus, and in uh, verse chapter 2, he says to the people there, he says, <clears throat> Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what were, then were you baptized? And they said unto him, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John barely baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with other tongues and prophesied. Paul was fully Pentecostal. And when he comes to Ephesus and first gets there, arrives there, he meets this group of people, these group, this group of disciples of John the Baptist, and he begins to talk with them. And he says, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? Have you received the Holy Spirit? <laughs> and they say to him, we haven't even so much as heard of the Holy Spirit. And so he goes on to communicate to them. He tells them about Jesus. They receive Christ. And then he lays hands on them and prays for them. And they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is a power moment. It is a wow moment. It is the kind of moment that confounds the wise and the intellectual. Amen. Paul is fully Pentecostal. What does that mean? Well, Pentecostal theology, very basic, simply says that is this. Jesus Christ is the center point of history. Jesus Christ, everything prior to the cross and after the cross points to this event. Because without Jesus Christ, and the cross of Christ, and the burial of Christ, and most of all, the resurrection of Christ, then Jesus would just be a man. He would just be a good man, maybe a prophet, 
but he's more than a prophet and he's more than a good man. He is the son of God. And that is why he went to a cross and was buried in a tomb for three days. And he got up out of the tomb and raised up in power, in victory, fully God, fully man, resurrected. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus Christ is the center point of all of human history. In this sense, he redeemed humanity to God. So he made a bridge from earth to heaven. He came from heaven to earth in order that earth, humanity, could go to heaven through him. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Pentecostal theology, Jesus Christ is our Savior. There is no other name under heaven by which a man or woman might be saved. <clears throat> There's no other name. Uh, no Buddha in, in a restaurant can help you. There's no God fashioned by the hands of man. There is no Hindu God. There is no other God. There's no God anywhere fashioned by man's hands that can save you and I. Only one gives us life and life eternal. And that is Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ, second of all, is our sanctifier. I was in a church recently. I talked about this very point. Jesus Christ is our sanctifier. Many people don't talk about that word anymore in churches. And they don't bring that word up much anymore. What does that word mean? And so I said to them, I said, well, let me put it in today's terms. Jesus Christ is our sanitizer. He cleans us up. Amen? And so he's our sanctifier. What does that mean? It means he sanitizes our heart and soul and our life. From the inside out, we become new creation, new creatures in Jesus Christ. He is our sanctifier. It means we're called to walk a holy life. We don't talk like everyone in the world talks. We don't think like they think. We don't watch what they watch. We don't do what they do. We live a different life. We live a holy life. Why? Because Jesus is in us, and we pursue him. And the Bible says, be holy as I am holy. For without holiness, no one will see God. We need to pursue Jesus, and he sanctifies us and cleanses us. And I, I use that word, you know, I think translate to the day's language he sanitizes us he is the one that cleans us up amen and continually does so jesus is our savior jesus christ is our sanctifier jesus christ is our holy spirit baptizer what does that mean pastor sean it simply means this it means that god the father in heaven when sin entered the earth had a plan and his plan was the sending of God, or the missio Dei, the mission of God, to send his son into the world, that through him the world might be saved. And so in this regard, Jesus Christ came into the world, was born in a, and laid in a manger. We know the, the, the birth story of Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary. He grew up. He knew no sin. Uh, he entered into ministry. He did at least 33 major miracles, some say 37 major miracles in three to three and a half years of ministry here on this earth. And in this time, he declared who he was, he, he exhibited who he was as the son of the living God. Before he left earth, he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and everywhere. He said, go, I will go and prepare a place for you. But he also said this, go wait for me in Jerusalem, and I'm going to send you a comforter. Now, another word he used there was dunamis. I'm going to endue you with power. That Greek word dunamis literally means power. There will be a power that comes into you. This was foretold through the prophecies that God gave through Joel the prophet. And throughout the Bible, and here Jesus Christ says, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. I'm sending you the Comforter. I'm sending you power. So the Father sent the Son, and the Son sends the Holy Spirit. And the disciples and, and their whole group went. There's about 120 of them in that upper room moment. 
And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. The Bible says it was like the sound of a rushing mighty wind. A hurricane, a storm, a typhoon blew into that upper room. And it was the power of the Holy Ghost. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is our Holy Spirit baptizer. Jesus Christ is also our healer. Jesus Christ is our healer. He exhibited his, in his life on this earth healing power. Now, there's two kind of levels of this, I believe. One of them is our spiritual healing. We are said, I already said Jesus Christ is our Savior. Well, part of the healing process is Jesus Christ provides the greatest healing miracle of all forever for everyone. What is that? It means that he provides eternal life for you and I. And absent from this body, we are present with the Lord. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. And so, although Jesus also heals disease, heal cancer, heart disease, diabetes, uh, heal other sicknesses, arthritis, heart attack, he can heal. He is our healer. He can even heal your heart wounds, your soul wounds, those wounds that you have from inflicted, perhaps, or I have at times where people have been. Uh, not so nice, or things have been challenging. Jesus Christ is our healer. Eternal life is eternal healing. Amen. Physical healing is only good for a little while, because we know that unless, unless we are caught away in the rapture someday, we're alive when Jesus comes, pulls us away. Uh, other than that, we will find our place at a moment in time where we transition from this body to eternity. And so Jesus Christ, though, is our healer in this present world. And we can pray and say, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would heal us. So I think there's some whole theology we can talk about in that regard. Why doesn't he heal everybody? Well, if they receive Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, they have eternal life, number one. And number two, um, he doesn't choose to heal everyone. But that's okay because it's in the sovereignty of God's will. And we have to pray and say, Lord, you lead us. We still believe by faith for healing. And we believe that Jesus heals. And we see miracles where Jesus heals. And I believe Jesus heals. And I pray, Jesus Christ, heal my body. Heal the body of those who are sick. Raise them up. Heal their sickness. Sometimes that works through the hands of a physician, perhaps. Or someone that would touch them. A pastor that says, in Jesus' name, be healed. Be set free. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. There is authority in the name of Jesus Christ. There is healing in the name of Jesus Christ. I've watched miracles. I've seen miracles happen where God raises people up, and heals them from cancer and sickness and all kinds of disease. Jesus Christ is our healer. Paul understood this. And finally, number five, these five points of Pentecostal theology, Jesus Christ is our soon coming king. Maranatha, we cry out, Lord, come quickly. Amen and amen. So in this message, the third point is this, Paul is strategic. Paul is strategic. Paul is, he is Pentecostal. He is born again. He is strategic. Why do you say that, Pastor Sean? He's strategic because we watch his processes in his journey. And we can watch him in Ephesus and what he does. He is intentional, flexible, focused, tenacious, and determined. You see, Paul is very intentional about where he goes. He is very flexible about how he needs to maneuver and change his plans. He is focused and never gives up on what he has to do. In fact, he's even tenacious. He will not let go of what God's called him to do. And he's determined to fulfill what God has asked him to do. Number four, Paul is productive. He's productive. 
I'm going to read a few scriptures here in this, this one point about Paul's productivity. Acts chapter 19 and verse 10 says this, And this continued by the space of two years, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now when it says, and this continued for two years, what is the scripture talking about? Well, here's Paul's journey. He gets to Ephesus. He meets these, these guys, and he prays for them, and they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They receive Jesus Christ and commit to him as their Savior. And then he goes to the synagogue, and he's, he goes to the steps of the synagogue. Now, it's very interesting to me. Here, here's how incredible God is in wisdom and strength. He calls Paul to go to Ephesus. Paul is known in his former life, Saul, the persecutor, Saul of Tarsus, Saul, the Pharisee of Pharisees, Saul, the teacher of Jews, Saul, a rabbi, uh, this, this zealot for Jewish religion, for religion, but he knew everything about being Jewish. He knew how as a little boy he would study the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the law. And he would study that every day as a little boy. And he would read that Hebrew language of the Torah. And the, the little boys would be in that Torah school and they would read those books. And they would learn those scrolls. And they would learn that language. And they would study those, those scriptures day in, day out, all the time. And then he knew what it was like to go from there and study the Talmud. In fact, that is the entire Old Testament that we have today. And so they would study the Talmud, the entire what we have as the Old Testament today, and learn, study the law, and study the word all the time, day in, day out. They, then they would go and sit at the feet of another rabbi, a teacher. Uh, after they finished studying the Torah and they've studied the Talmud, then they would go and they would learn from a rabbi daily. And so Paul, Paul, formerly known as Saul, had been through this journey as a Jewish young man. And he went to this city and he knew exactly the culture. He knew exactly what to do. He knew exactly where to go. He knew exactly how to talk. And he walks to the synagogue steps. Now, it's important to even realize this. In that custom, in that culture, in that day, ancient Near Eastern history, um, when you went to the temple, for instance, many rabbis would go and stand at the steps of the temple. On the way into the temple in Jerusalem, they would, they would go and stand on those steps, and they would debate, and they would talk, and they would discuss, and they would teach. Oh, the temple stairs were massive, and they were extremely wide. Where you know you could have 10, 20 different teachers spread out in little groups, teaching in any given moment their students. And so Paul understood this, and he understood that going to the synagogue, he would go and he stand. And these are smaller steps; these aren't like the temple. But he would go stand on these steps, and he would teach every day people that would come and listen, until until. They got upset with him, and they threw him out. But here's the point. This is part of what was continuing for two years, Paul's teaching. Not only did he teach and preach on the steps, but later uh, he moved from the steps. Now, part of also what was happening, not only his teaching and his preaching, but if you go to Acts chapter 19, 11, and 12, the Bible says this, And God wrought. And God wrought miracles. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. So that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. There's a very significant point here. And here, here's something to understand. In the Pentecostal uh, journey of church, we will bring prayer cloths at times and we will anoint the prayer cloth 
and we will send them to people who are sick. This is, this is significant to that. So they were taking pieces of cloth and they were praying over them from Paul's rope. They just took what they had. Uh, now you have to imagine how valuable was a piece of material in this day. I mean, it wasn't like you just go down to uh, the material store, like Joanne's, or um, another material store uh, where you find material, or a fabric store somewhere, or in Los Angeles, the fabric market, yeah, you know, the merchandise, the, the, the clothing market there, the fabric market. It's not like you just go and buy that stuff. People made and wove cloth, and it was very expensive, perhaps, to buy material. But it's all they had. And so Paul even took his outer garment and began to cut it up so they could take this, anoint it, pray over it, and send it to sick people. And they would take that, and they would send it to them. And from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them. And the evil spirits went out of them. How significant and powerful is that? Phenomenal. Praise be to God. And then going further, it's important to understand that um, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 17, the Bible says this, and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks who were dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. This is the productivity that Paul was experiencing. In verse 18 and 19, the Bible says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts, this is witchcraft, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. How incredible and phenomenal. In verse 20, the Bible says this, So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now, right now, we look around our culture in the United States of America. We look down around the world. There's all kinds of tension and turmoil and struggle. There's all kinds of political struggle going on. There, is, there have been riots in the streets. There have been protests. There have been everything you can imagine. And so we can look on the surface level and say, okay, uh, we've got the Democrats and the Republicans in the United States. You have the independents. You have all this stuff happening. Look, God is calling us, the church, to go deeper. To go deeper. What do you mean, Pastor Sean, go deeper? Listen. Paul lived in a world where he was preaching uphill. And if he walked in his human flesh, he was preaching uphill in a Roman world that uh, was, you know, Greek mythology was all over the place in Asia. And here he was. And then you had the Jewish religiosity and everything that was happening. He walks into Ephesus. He's preaching the gospel. And when he starts preaching the gospel, everything goes crazy. Uh, not only does it go crazy in the good sense, it goes crazy in the bad sense because he's preaching Jesus, people are being born again. He's preaching Jesus, people are being transformed. People are being set free. The enemy is upset, the enemy of our soul. Satan is mad. This is a spiritual battle. And it is significant that in Ephesians chapter 6, remember he's in Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, but later on he writes a letter to the Ephesians and in chapter 6 of Ephesians, he talks about spiritual warfare. And it's like he's saying to them, remember, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of darkness in high places. And he begins to tell them about putting on the full armor of God. And it's significant that that is in chapter 6 of the book of Ephesians, or this letter that he writes to the Ephesian church. And here, before he wrote that letter, he is experiencing the battles firsthand. And when he's walking in, he's telling about Jesus. People are being set free. People are being healed from their diseases. They're being filled with the Holy Spirit. Demons are being cast out. Um, they, they're casting out all this stuff. There is a revival going on. And because there's a revival going on, all of a sudden there's a riot. Wow. Wild stuff. 
Now, the riot didn't come from the Christians doing anything except doing what Jesus called us to do. Pray, love, present Jesus Christ, walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, walk in the anointing of the gospel. And so in a world where they had no power, humanity-wise, they said, we're under Roman authority. There was no power there. They didn't have a, a president or an emperor that was following Jesus. But they followed Jesus, and they preached the gospel, and they turned the city upside down. That's a wow moment. That's incredible. And so this verse, verse 20, so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. And so the title of this message is simply this, walk that way. Walk that way. Walk what way, Pastor Sean? Walk in the anointing and the power of Jesus Christ. The same anointing and power that Paul walked in. That we go in and we share the gospel with people and they're transformed and they receive Jesus. That they're filled with the Holy Spirit. We lay hands on them and they're filled with the Holy Ghost. And they're healed and they're set free and they're delivered from demons and they're delivered from bondage. And there is something that happens. What happens? The Word of God will prevail. The Word of God will mightily grow in the cities, in the communities. We pray for Sacramento. We pray for California. We're believing for revival. And it happens through the church. Walk that way. Walk in the power and the anointing of Jesus Christ. Walk in the authority of Jesus Christ. Walk in the victory of Jesus Christ. Walk in the, the absolute healing power of Jesus Christ. Believe in him, but don't just believe him in our mind cognitively or in our heart by faith, but connect our private life with our public life and begin to communicate Jesus in a way that turns cities upside down. You see, a gospel-producing lifestyle is an intentional, strategic journey that moves the church. If we were all together today, I would say, look at your neighbor, everybody, and say, the church needs to move. If you're wherever you're at in your house or your room, just say, the church needs to move. Well, where do we need to move to? We don't need to move to another building. We need to move in our lives out of the sanctuary and into the community. We need to move out of a comfort zone and into a risk zone. Wow. We need to move out of the known and into the unknown. Paul went into the unknown. He ventured into Ephesus. When he got stuck in one place, he moved to another, but he kept preaching. A gospel-producing lifestyle takes the church from administrative to apostolic. It takes the church from management to movement. A gospel-producing lifestyle is an intentional journey that Causes a disturbance. Causes a disturbance. Some time ago, uh, my wife and I were in, living in Chicago, Illinois, a long time ago. And um, we were very young then, much, much younger than we are now. And um, we were pastoring a church on a, on a corner there, and we were living in that city and we were pastoring this church it was an existing church we've been assigned or appointed to pastor this church and we were there one time we we planned we planned for months to do this big outdoor event we closed off the street legally we got the city councilman to give us the permit the alderman to close the street we closed the street we put up bounce houses we built a stage we had a choir we had more one more choir right? multiple choirs we had preaching, we had singing, we had all kinds of stuff going on. We gave away food, hot food, we gave away groceries, all in this area, just outreach, outreach, giving out in this big block party moment. And we had people that would stop by and they'd go, we didn't know this was a church. I said, really? He said, yeah, we, didn't, we never knew this was a church. I looked and went, wow, you didn't know? And I said, well, are you new to the neighborhood? Oh no, we've lived here for years. And that was so sad to me because, you know, if the church is there and nobody knows it's a church, wow, that's convicting. Very, very sad. We need to wake up, perhaps, and be the church. 
And so we did in our church there, we woke up and we did our best to, you know, just to let people know this is who we are. But today we have great opportunity. Many of us have looked at this moment and we've seen this moment and there are people that are fussing and fighting and they're filing lawsuits and we're trying to restrict Christianity and religion and all this stuff's going on. And I get that. But is there something more that God's trying to tell us? Is he trying to show us that maybe some of the stuff that we've been doing, some of the things we've been doing are not deep enough. We're not discipling people in the way that we need to disciple them. This is a hard word. It's a hard thought. Now, this is not saying that we shouldn't have service on Sunday. I don't mean that at all. We need to come together and worship and gather. But if gathering is our only point, then are we missing the point? Because Jesus didn't just, he didn't say, you know, go and have a really nice church service and don't do anything else. He said, go and make disciples of all nations. And so I don't know that we can really have one without the other. We need both. And I think the church in America, um, in the last while, has really been focused on one at the, at the too often at the demise of the other. Now, um, that's a challenging word, but here's the reality is God has called us to do what? To walk like Paul walked, to walk like Jesus walked, to walk like the disciples walked, to go and make disciples. A gospel-producing lifestyle is an intentional, strategic journey that causes a disturbance. Something happens when we show up. We should expect something to happen. The second question in this, this whole message today is, where is my Ephesus? I talk about Paul being strategic and intentional, and he went to the steps of the synagogue. He found his place in that moment where God was leading him to, and he knew what his mission was. He knew he was there to transform this city in the power and strength of, of Jesus Christ, and he knew he was there to communicate Jesus to these people and bring forward the power of the Holy Spirit, and he would preach on those synagogue steps. He got chased away from there. He goes somewhere else in the city. He, he rents this school, the school of Tyrant, Tyrannus, in the afternoons. In the morning, we don't know. Maybe he was praying. Maybe he was walking. Maybe he was praying for people. Maybe he was making tents in order to eat. And so he would do that trade. Uh, we do know that he was a tent maker. And you know, we know he was from Joppa, which was a place where they made the fibers to make tents. He knew this trade. We, we don't know exactly, but we do know in the afternoon he was continuing to teach and preach the gospel in Ephesus. So when he gets thrown out of one place, he doesn't give up. He keeps going, and he goes to the next place. We know that in the whole midst of all, there is all kinds of stuff going on, but it doesn't deter Paul. He goes, and he, he realizes, I've got to be who God's called me to be. And something happens when he shows up. Something happens when Jesus shows up. What happens when you and I show up? Question number two, where is my Ephesus? Is my Ephesus my school? Is my Ephesus my house? Is my Ephesus my neighborhood, my community? Is my Ephesus my workplace? Is my Ephesus my city? Is my Ephesus in Elk Grove? Is my Ephesus in Sacramento? Is my Ephesus somewhere else around uh, the city? Is my Ephesus in a neighborhood? Where is my Ephesus? Question three, what is my Ephesus? What is God calling me to do, and how will I do it, and how will I speak? Uh, question four, one of the most profound questions for all of Christianity today, am I producing? Is there production from my life? Am I producing? Very powerful question. Paul led people in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul prayed for people to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and believe that they would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Paul preached and taught with strategic intent. Question number five, is something happening? Is something happening? Question six, is there a disturbance? 
is something going on? Question seven, simply this. Do people see the way in me? What does that mean? Before people were called Christians, in fact, the word Christian was a derogatory term. Derogatory in the sense that it was a slur. It was something people would look at and say, oh, you're one of those Christians. You're one of them. And so it was a way that people would deride or put down people that follow Jesus. But before we were called Christians, historically, we were known as followers of the way of Jesus Christ. And so in this question, I simply ask this. Do people see the way of Jesus Christ in me? Do they see Jesus in me? Question seven. This message is simply entitled this, Walk That Way. Walk that way. Yeah, we need to walk holy. Yes, we need to be different. We need to come out from among them. But we also need to be the people turning the city upside down in the name of Jesus Christ. We should be ones that, not because of uh, going and rioting or protest, none of that, no but because of prayer and fasting and communicating Jesus and seeing people born again and set free, that there's a disturbance. In the city of Ephesus, they sold their main, one of their main commerce um, products was business products. One of their, their, their main uh, items for sale were idols. And when people got born again, they stopped buying the idols. And you read about Alexander the coppersmith and, and these individuals that started part of this riot was because they were not making money because nobody was buying their idols because they weren't following the goddess Artemis anymore. Now they were following Jesus. So they got mad. Well, praise the Lord they got mad because people were no longer on a highway to an eternity without God, but now they knew Jesus Christ. There, was re there were results from their lives. Walk that way. I want to pray with you today, and I thank you for allowing me to come and be with you. This is a message that I sense to bring to you today, and a message the Lord is continually developing in my life. And I want to just take a moment and pray with you, and I ask you in this moment to lift your hands toward heaven, wherever you are, in your house, uh, here with me in this great room, and. Um, Wherever you are, if you'll just lift your hands toward heaven right now, and I want to pray for you and with you. Father, I pray for every person who is part of this incredible church. We pray as we gather right now, this morning, God, that you would stir our lives to be deeper in relationship with you through relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. God, that you would cause us to be sanctified through the power of Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. I pray that if there is a person here today that doesn't have relationship with Jesus Christ, God, you would touch them right now. In whatever home or house or wherever they are right now, they would say, I want to know Jesus. And they would talk to the people around them. They would pray and receive Jesus and be saved. And God, if there's someone here today that says, I am not been filled with the Holy Spirit, I pray, God, you would fill them with your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we, we just pray. Be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And Father, I pray that those around those individuals would pray for them. And God, there'd be miracles. I pray today we join together in faith believing that Jesus Christ, Christ is our healer. God, that you would heal diseases and heal sicknesses and heal woundedness and brokenness. Heal today. And Father, we pray today in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray for fire from heaven. Fire, the anointing, the dunamis power that comes from the infilling of the Holy Spirit and the anointing of Jesus Christ to saturate us in such a way that we walk like all walk. 
We walk like Peter walked. We walk like Aquila and Priscilla walked. We walk God like Dorcas walked. We walk in the powerful ways of Jesus Christ. God, I pray for the eternal life, Church of God, for the Sam Cuddy family. We ask you to bless this incredible family. And God, touch them today and bless these elders and bless this church in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And God, that they would be a light in the darkness, shining Jesus Christ, the light of the world. God, we give you glory and honor and praise today. And I pray your anointing, blessing on every house in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you, Pastor. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, uh, I mean, kind, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, uh, message and also it's a challenging message and powerful message. Hallelujah. So our church is blessed by you, and uh, we are here in the presence of God. We are always reminded about your message, and uh, we are so thankful to you for joining with us in this so meeting and preaching to us and giving the advices and the instruction for uh, uh, to to move forward. You know, even I was also preaching about the same thing in the previous two uh, weeks to how to move forward, amen, and how to be filled with the Holy Spirit and witness Jesus Christ in different places of our city, amen. So we are, I mean, always reminded about that message and uh, I mean, uh, thank you, thank you so much for, I mean, speaking to us this morning also. And uh, uh, I don't want to, I mean, elaborately say anything about uh, the messages and because we have already, I mean, received that challenging and powerful message.